My son peers at me over the top of his 25th birthday card. It reads simply, happy birthday, you are amazing. I'm so proud of you, love dad. He blinks, I thought you were a writer, dad. <laughs> the card says exactly what his sister's birthday card had said six weeks before. The, the cards must be the same because she's a younger sibling and rightfully attentive to any moment where her older brother might be favored. Yeah, Dad, she says to me from beside him at the birthday table, a writer. Whew. My children tease as I trip through their minefield of birthday cards and praise. Why is it so hard to say the right thing? When I was my daughter's age, 23, I visited my father in his kitchen. I'd graduated with honors from an Ivy League school, and this was expected, and I'd been a valedictorian of my high school class, and this was expected, and I had an ulcer, and my stomach burned every day, and this was secret. And I'd just done all the expected things, and now I didn't know what to do anymore. I was lost. At night, I kept imagining killing myself with a 38 revolver on the top shelf of my father's closet. How the bullet would be hot as it spun up out of the barrel. I'd be thinking about how to angle the barrel to hit my brainstem because the shells in the ammunition box next to it were round nose and not hollow points, so I must aim precisely because failure at this would be shameful. I worked up the nerve to tell my father about this little problem over dinner. I don't know what I'm doing anymore, Dad. I feel useless, and I keep thinking of killing myself. I feel so shitty. And we're both standing now, and I'm crying. Were you ever proud of me? I ask him. And my father blinks at this question, and then he looks away. His body still faces me, but his gaze is averted, as if I were naked. And in his expression, I see both despair and disgust. And he says, I was, and he rocks uneasily on his feet, generally satisfied. I walk around the table to hug him, but he won't look at me, and he's stiff, and he's so thick, it's like hugging a tree, and he doesn't hug me back, and he's a doctor, you know, a lieutenant colonel, a flight surgeon, he's investigated the aircraft accidents where he's looked into the dead faces of pilots who were his friends, and he does not cry. I have a colleague who is a psychiatrist, says my father. Do you want to talk to him? I don't speak again with my father about feeling sad because uh, dysfunction is weakness and weakness is a sin. It's something for others, not us. Last month, my daughter and I flew to see my father. My sister and her daughter met us there, a cautious, family reunion, and unspoken potential goodbye. Also, I'm executor of his will, and he wanted to show me what to do, the things to divide, the things to sell, the things to give away. The headstone is already paid for, he told me. Don't let them charge you anything. <laughs> it's important to my father that everything is paid for and arranged ahead of time by him. His departure must be a final demonstration of self-reliance. He showed me the box of framed diplomas, awards, a picture of him getting his silver oak leaves. This would be good if you needed to write uh, the kinds of things they, they say about a person they put into the paper. He, he cannot muster the word obituary, not because he's sad, but because he can't find it. It's been less than a year since my last visit, but his memory is going, and he knows. This is my, 
machine for turning things I don't want other people to have into dust. He can't remember what it's called. He's pointing at a paper shredder. <laughs> I want to tell my father that Katrina, my, my older sister, will do a better job of executing his estate. She's better with people and details and remembering things and selling, but this cannot be. I am the firstborn son, and to our father, it seems, there is a rule. Later, when we're back in San Diego, my daughter and I talk about the visit. When you speak, your father looks at you like, uh-huh, and he's nodding, and he wants to agree. Oh, when your sister speaks, and this would kill me if I were her, he's looking away. My daughter's nodding as she says this to me, and I see the skin where she's picked a scab on her cheek, and it's it's bleeding. Of course, Finn got all your time, she says. It's obvious. It's the boy bonus. I feel sick inside. I think of people I've known without fathers. Fathers who left them. Fathers who drank. Fathers who hit them. These people were starved for fathers. I was fed. Who am I to complain my food was sometimes cold? I'm sorry, I reply to my daughter. I wish I could go back in time and do better. It feels like all I can say. When we visited my father, I stayed on an extra day after my daughter and the others left. And that evening, dad and his partner, Anne, and I watched the Olympic trials on TV. Anne's phone rang, and after a moment, she lowered it from her ear. My son just died. She keeps looking at the phone in her hand, and a few seconds pass. I don't cry, though, she says, mostly to herself. And the runners on TV keep running as hard as they can in bright spandex, and their legs are pumping. And I'm, I'm so sorry, I say. I wait for my father to say something, but he doesn't. He's looking away, again, away from Anne at the television, and he doesn't turn it off or down. He leans back in his seat to get his head further away from the emotion, from the stain of it. And the runners keep circling, suddenly cruel, and I find myself flinching at the voice of the sports announcer. We hadn't talked in 10 years, continues Anne, but we talked when he was here a month ago, so there's nothing on me there. Finally, my father speaks, and he says, drugs get some people, he tells the TV screen. Not all, but some. And then it's worse than living. There's some relief, maybe, when it's over. Anne says nothing as she sinks back down onto the couch. And as promised, she does not cry. And then to fill the space, my father says to me, over the sound of the TV announcer, remember when you had that first paper published? You were only an undergraduate. He says to me, your daughter is doing quite well, and your son too? I, I don't know how to respond. He seems to be telling Anne, your son died? My family's fine. And I grope for words, and nothing comes. His machine has turned the praise I'd once wanted into dust. And eventually, I changed the subject back to Anne's son and the arrangements of his service. And I try to give Anne a hug goodnight, but she pulls away. And I go to bed angry, angry that my father could treat Anne that way in that moment. But later, as I'm lying in the dark, I come to understand and love him better. 
He has what he was given, and it was not praise. It was not comfort. It was a code. To be dependent on the good opinion of another is weakness, and weakness is a sin. And to give praise, to give comfort, to imply that dependence, this is not done. Because to do so would insult the receiver. Dad did not comfort me at 23, and he did not comfort Anne at 86. He does not give praise or comfort because for him, withholding them is exactly how one shows respect and love. And it's an old code, good for the 1800s when the children mostly died, when <laughs> frontier life depended on a strength of will. I mean, it was less needed by 1937 when my, my father and Anne were born into it. It was even less needed in 1969 when I was born to, into it. And in 1999 and 2001 when my children were born, it was archaic, but it still lived inside me all through their childhoods. And even now, as a stern stranger judging my words, now my father and his ways prepare for their departure. And I am helping. Now I am doing it for duty and for compassion and not for praise. A week ago, I was alone in my car in a dark parking lot. And I just purchased ingredients to make tacos, beans, and rice for the dinner I make for my kids every Sunday. And I was thinking about my father, and my phone buzzed. Can you house it for my cat? <laughs> it's my daughter. <laughs> and we chat a bit, and I tell her I'm happy to watch her cat, and that I'm excited to see her and her brother for taco night. And she brings up our talk a few days before when I'd shown her a story about hurt and understanding across generations. Don't get bogged down in the sad bits, she tells me. Leave them out. Uh, I, w I will. <laughs> uh, tell her. I'm worried you're going to create some kind of narrative where you need my forgiveness, she tells me. Don't do that. <laughs> then she tells me, we're all doing what we can. Did you fuck up your children less than your parents fucked you up? <laughs> yeah? then you did your job. <laughs> Thanks, I say. <laughs> I love you. When and if you have kids, you'll get your shot working on our family culture. <laughs> and I know you'll do great. <sighs> she will, too. Generation by generation, my kids will get their shot, and they'll do great. I believe in them. And that's the highest praise I know. James Biggs, ladies and gentlemen, James Biggs.